Hello, hello, hello. It's Lisa Copeland. Happy Monday. I know today's a holiday for many people. And if you're in school, I know that there's a lot of kids are back in school today, making up for being off for the last six months. So I'm really excited today. You know, I've really um, kept my eye on what's going on for this election in November. And those of you who know me know that I'm a, that I, that I just, I just can't help but get involved. And I know a lot of us out there, you know, we all have very, very, um, definite opinions about the national races. But how many of you really know what's going on in your backyard? I will be the first one to tell you, I could have told you that I can tell you the platform of my candidates on a national level and their opponents. But then I really started to check myself and I thought, what the heck is going on in my backyard? There has been a lot of stuff. I live in Cedar Park, Texas. And there's been a lot of stuff that's happened in my backyard that's even made the national news. So as I started to dig around, you know, these House Senate, these House um, district races are so important. And I happen to live in District um, 136, which is Cedar Park, Leander, and then Northwest Austin. And so I, I've done something I've never done before. I called up the candidate. Um, who is opposing, who is running against the incumbent. And I said, you know, for you to earn my vote, I need to know some more about you. You know, are you willing to, you know, have a conversation with me to get on a Facebook live show um, and have an honest conversation? And, you know, you always think with, with politicians and with candidates, oh, they're so busy, they're out block walking, they're out doing whatever. But, you know, my guest said, absolutely, you know, no holds barred. You know, you ask me what you want to ask me because, you know, I, I am committed to be a servant of the people on top of the fact, I'll be honest with you, Lisa, I want your vote. But see, no, somebody doesn't just get my vote. They have to earn my vote. And so anyways, I want to I'm really excited to bring on my guest, Mike Guevara. Um, he is a resident of Cedar of Cedar Park, Texas. He he just formally stepped down from our city council, which is a nonpartisan council where he did some really good work for us. And he's thrown his his hat into a race for Texas, um, for the Texas District 136. And it's not going to be an easy race, right? And so anyways, he has agreed to be on the show. He's agreed to answer some questions for me. If you live in Central Texas, if you and if you live in Austin, because he also is looking to um, run for part of Northwest Austin, if you live there, share this out, ask your questions. You know, we all have a right to know what's going on in our backyard. I think we can just get so hyper focused on these national races, which frankly, I don't feel like I have anything or any say in what I can do on these races. And all I can do is I can vote just like every single one of you. But on our local races, when when things are going on in our backyard, I think we got to start taking care of what's happening at home. So without further ado, I want to bring on um, the Republican candidate for House District 136, which is Northwest Austin, Cedar Park and Leander, Texas, Mike Guevara. Mike, hello. Hi, good morning, Lisa. Thank you for having me on. You're welcome. You're welcome. Did you eat your Wheaties this morning? That's what I need to know. <laughs> I have so many questions I, for you. What's that? I have so many questions for you. I actually took advantage of the, the holiday and took my son down to Rudy's and got a breakfast taco this morning. So it's been the time with my son. So I think I'm good. Oh, that's great. You know, my grandkids, now they're in Belton School District, but they had to go to school today. Oh, really? Yep. And I asked, and my oldest one's in third grade and I was with him yesterday and I said, Eli, I said, how come you have to go to school today? He goes, because we got a lot of time to make up for Lala. <laughs> I'm not eight years old and you understand yeah. that. So Mike, tell us a little bit about you. Okay. Uh, like you said, my name is Mike Guevara and I, I heard your intro and I was on the Cedar Park City Council for about two and a half years. It was supposed to be two years, but because of the COVID, our May elections were pushed into November. I uh, just uh, officially resigned. Uh, the, our charter has a clause that once you get so close to an election, if you've run for another spot, then you have to re you have to resign. So, uh, officially resigned from the council. Enjoyed uh, that opportunity being on the council. I've lived here in District 136 in Cedar Park. It'll be 20 years in January, so I've been here quite a while uh, since I graduated from the, the University of Texas School of Law. And uh, the, my primary practice is I actually represent municipalities. So. Uh, when I was recruited to run for a uh, city council, the first question that was asked of me is, what do you know about municipal governments? I actually thought it was a joke when they asked me the question because it's basically what I do every day. Right. And uh, so I uh, ran for the council. But, you know, with that experience of, of working for cities as their city attorney, 
you know, I get to handle all kinds of things, legislation, I get to draft legislation and act with legislation, enforce legislation. Uh, you know, I've worked with uh, individuals from the federal government, state government, county governors, other municipalities, you know, across both parties. So I've got a lot of experience doing with that. Uh, I'm a prosecutor, so I understand the justice system. Uh, so that's my primary work. I'm also blessed to work with uh, foster families as they're trying to adopt kids out of the, the CPS system. Uh, my dad was a police officer. He did 41 years for the city of Dallas. So law enforcement is a big deal for me. Uh, my mom was a school nurse uh, with the Dallas Independent School District. And then she went to a private school from there she retired from. So, you know, that's my background. That's where I'm from. I'm a follower of Christ. Uh, my wife, uh, Amy and I attend Hill Country Bible Church. And we have two children, uh, Chloe, who's 11, and Anthony, who is eight. So that's real quick who I am. What is your what? wife like? She's, uh, we're blessed that she's able to be a stay at home mom. She actually worked at a bank right up until our daughter was born. And then she's been able to stay home uh, with them, which I believe is invaluable, invaluable to their development. So I know not everybody can do it, but we're very blessed for her to be able to do that. That's awesome. So, you know, we've got a little bit of feedback. I'm not sure if um, you've got your phone next to you and it's playing, but you just want to turn down the volume. My phone is off, so I don't know. Oh, okay. I'm not sure. That's, turn the volume that's okay. We'll just, we'll just push through it. All right. So it's very interesting. So you're an attorney that represents municipalities. Now, are you currently with your law firm? Are you currently representing any municipalities that we would know of or, you know, in central Texas? So in central Texas, I'm the city attorney for Bertram, which is in Bernie County. Oh. And we've done some work for Bartlett, which is right on the edge of, of Bell and Williamson County. And also city attorney for Holland, which is in Bell County. we got some other cities you get further out in the hill country, like Lamita and some cities around the San Antonio, New Braunfels area. And I represent cities all the way up to Wichita Falls, up to the Lubbock area. No kidding. My husband and I just bought a land in Florence and we're building kind of a weekend home there. So right all up. All up in there. So if, if you should happen to be elected to this position, well, does that mean that you have to or you will give up your law practice or will you be able to do both? Yes, I'll be able to do both. Um, I actually just I was able to hire a, a new attorney to come in and work for me. He started right after Labor Day this year. I've been courting him for three years and he, he finally decided he wanted to move back to Texas. And Longhorn so, or Aggie? Well, actually, he's a West Virginia Mountaineer. Huh? He's a West Virginia Mountaineer. Oh, okay. He's from, here. He's from here. He's from Round Rock originally and uh, went off to West Virginia to get his law degree. So uh, so he's still Big 12, but, you know, we don't have to have quite the rivalry, which is good. Um, so, you know, one, one weekend a year we get to be at odds. But besides that, uh, it's, it's, it's been a good fit. So hopefully he's going to be and, and has been in the position to start, you know, taking over some of that stuff, the, the slack, because that was the reason, because I am planning on winning and uh, being representing the – House District 136 in Austin in the in the winter and spring. So I wanted to have somebody who could step into my shoes and keep the law practice going. Okay, so let me ask you about that. You know, and I you said something about you know the police and justice and, and doing and being actually being a, a, a pro, you currently a prosecutor or you're a former prosecutor. No, I'm, I'm currently the prosecutor for multiple municipalities. Okay, so, you know, something that has been really, really, and this is one of the reasons I reached out to you, you know, gosh, you know, I'm losing track of time now, but in the last, I'd say, 90 days, our, our beautiful town that you and I both live in, Cedar Park, Texas, made the national news. Yes. And we made the national news because of a gun standoff, because of a hostage situation that all of our law enforcement, all the cities, municipalities, it seems like everybody came together and successfully, um, you know, negotiated uh, away the, or I don't know the word I'm looking for, but success successfully after many days ended it without violence. Right. And, um, and they did a really good job. So my hat's off to all the law enforcement out there. I am a big supporter of the blue and I am forever grateful for those that, um, that are willing to go out and put their lives on the line every single day for us. Um, but of course you cannot turn on the news today and especially, you know, so we are in Williamson County, you and I, and we uh, we join up to Travis County, which, of course, is uh, where the state capital of Texas is, Austin, Texas. And um, after in the wake of many things, the Austin City Council made the decision to defund the police department. Now, you know, you hear all kinds of things. And I don't know if you've ever watched the movie uh, on Netflix, Social Dilemma, but it's frightening. And so my understanding, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that Austin voted 
to cut the police budget by one third. And that includes parks, drugs, and DWIs. Am I correct with that? Yes, that's that's my understanding from the documentation that I have read, $150 million. Mm -hmm. And so will you give me your definition of defunding the police? Because I will tell you, I put that up and I got some blowback from some people around the country. And they said, you know, that isn't what it means. And I said, you know, you cut the budget of the police department, $150 million. You cannot keep everybody on the payroll. Like I have run many, many multi-million dollar businesses. And I know what it is to cut the budget. You end up cutting human capital. Sure. So let's go back to the original question. And I'll talk to you a little okay. bit more about the effects of defunding. So you did, you asked an excellent question. And I think that's a question that a lot of people have been, I don't know if struggling with, but there is some, there's some disagreement on what the term defunding is meant is, is we've been block walking and I, I've block walked at least one day a week, sometimes two, three days a week since August 1st. So we've been out there knocking on our doors. Uh, you know, I have a very loyal group of supporters. And so that's one of the things that people really want to talk about is the defunding of peace, police. When Austin cut the budget $150 million, my phone blew up from residents in Cedar Park. What is Austin, what is Cedar Park going to do? Because we share a border. That's the reason I called you. I'm like, this is not happening in my hometown. Right. And, and we've had a lot of that. So I, I had a, a conversation with an individual at, at the door, several individuals about the the term defunding, and one of them said, actually told me that it was the, to, to use the term defunding was a lie, and that he hoped that I was not spreading that around. And so uh, it ended up that he he went out after we spoke, and he walked, and he found us. And we had a great conversation. And I'll get to that in a second. But you know, you talk about defunding, and you know, city budgets. I'm very familiar with city budgets, being on city council in Cedar Park. We passed three budgets uh, as as a city attorney for small municipalities, I mean, I have been actually the person, which it's not, it's not necessarily my role that has had the budget in hand, gone through it, set the tax rate, done everything for some of these small cities. So I'm very familiar with budgets and, and the term defunding does not mean abolish. If we were saying abolish the police, that would be a different. Now that's been spoken about in other parts of the country, but let's, let's just make it simple. You've got two pots of money. You have a hundred thousand dollars to spend, you put 50 in one pot, 50 in another pot. If you take money out of pot A and put it in pot B, you are defunding pot A. It's, it's that simple. You're not saying you're abolishing pot A and pot A is going away, but you are absolutely defunding it. And so they, what Austin did is they defunded the police. There's, there, there's no other way to, to talk about that. And, you know, when you talk about specifically what Austin did, the, the most disheartening thing for me as a minority, as a Hispanic, is that this, the, even though Austin PD was already short officers, they cut three academy classes. And those three academy classes were a majority minority. And so we were actually putting more minority officers into the Austin Police Department than, than Caucasian officers. And, and that's what I hear the rhetoric screaming and yelling is equality. And so we were actually going majority minority and that got cut. Uh, you know, and, and they also cut training. So that's, you hear you know, talking about the training and training is very, very important. And you talked about what happened in Cedar Park. And you know, we had three officers that were shot on that. And you know, there's been some, some talk. And I, I have some friends who are show, social workers because I work with the foster agencies. And so we've had some time to talk about this. But uh, you know, those officers went in. They were armed. They were trained. Uh, one of the officers, it was her, her vest that saved her. And yeah. if you were to send a social worker in on that situation, I, I don't need to explain to you what would have happened to that social worker. Because You're they don't trained. have they're not. They don't have that training. And so, uh, you know, my chief, Mike Harmon, they did a, our department did a fantastic job uh, with the yeah, help. I recommend them officers. highly. I do. I'm very proud of them. Yes. And, and you know, the one of the things that and go back and look, if you haven't looked at look at his interview that he gave that night. I mean, it was humane is the only way that I could put it. There was compassion really was. to everybody, even to the person who had shot his three officers. You could tell that there was compassion in him and he was treating this person just as that, as a person, not as a, a suspect or someone need to be taken out, but a person and doing do, And I believe that's the reason that it went well. But, you know, officers have training. Yes, they're not social workers, but they do have mental health training for the for the bigger departments. And that's actually one thing I would like to see uh, as if I become state representative is I would like to see that the state of Texas uses the resources to train our department to our DPS officers. 
And but a lot of smaller departments, particularly the ones I work with, they don't have the resources and the funding to do those types of level of training. I'd like to see the state use those resources and when they have classes, invite the small communities to send their. I was just going to say that. Why are we not inviting the smaller police for right. to in and forces in to to benefit from? I know the great strength. I mean, our DPS in Texas, they are second to none. Those guys are love them. I don't love them when they pull me over on I-35 because I'm speeding, but <laughs> I do sleep better at night knowing that that is to protect the great state of Texas. So, okay, so one of the reasons I called you because this whole thing in Cedar Park really, I mean, it happened about two or three miles from my home. And you know, I had people from all over the country calling me because it made national news. Um, and, you know, I didn't, I didn't really have my eyes really tight on this local race. I don't know why. I really, I don't know why. Like in my backyard. I mean, I'm going to be the first one to admit that. And before I came on the show, I said, if you, whoever you are, wherever you are, you live in the country, you better be watching out what's going on in your backyard. And so I called several friends of mine trying to track you down. And I want to have a conversation with you. And a, a good friend of mine told me that um, your opponent, and I don't know if this is true or not, I'm just asking you, you may or may not want to comment, um, that your opponent, John Boosie, um, contributed $2,500 to the Austin Justice Coalition. And the biggest, one of the biggest, uh, and maybe the whole reason it was formed was to fund the police department. And I, you know, I was like, you gotta be joking. Like, what? And yeah, and I, I didn't see the check, but I, I know that it has been verified even with the Texas Ethics Commission, because as candidates or as, as elected officials, we do have to submit periodic reports. It's twice a year and right before the election, it, it ramps up from that. But uh, so that has been confirmed with the, the Texas Ethics Commission. You know, and, it, and it, where, where I see it, most everything else is quite honestly, is heartbreaking. Uh, as the son of a police officer who I watched my dad sacrifice so much uh, for 41 years to keep the, the Dallas community safe, to provide that funding. And, you know, that one of the things that's interesting is that funding that was provided was actually from his campaign funding. So it was actually people who had provided him money. And so I wonder what they would think if they thought that some of their funds went to uh, lobby to, to defund the, which was successful, the the Austin Police Department. But if you go on the Austin Justice Coalition, and I haven't been there in a couple of days, I want to say it was Friday was the last day I looked at it. It says right on the front page, imagine a world without police. And, you know, I told you I talked to that individual about the term defunding. And I told him, I said, go to the Austin Justice Coalition. You don't have to believe me. It doesn't say reimagined police. It doesn't say less police. It says imagine a world without police. And there's a little button right underneath it. This is defund APD. And I assume I haven't clicked on the button, but I assume you click on that button and it tells you uh, how to give and, and how to defund APD. And that's what uh, our current state representative in in Williamson County, House District 136, has provided funding to that organization. And apologetically, I, I haven't heard of apologetic, apologizing. Or have you debated him? Have you asked him this? Have you all had that conversation? We have not had the conversation. We've done a couple of forms, but unfortunately, there is no debate. I uh, would lo love to have that opportunity if he, if he wants to do that. Uh, but early voting starts tomorrow. So, you know, early voting does start tomorrow. So, so get out and, and vote on that. But, uh, you know, as you, you talk about the, uh, you know, the defunding of the police in APD, why well, I think that's really, really important to House District 136 is part of, as you said, part of Austin is in House District 136. So he gave funding to an organization that is actively trying to abolish. And it says without. I'm not talking about defund here. I'm talking about abolish the police. Gave money to an organization that wants to abolish the police in his district. In his district. Which uh, is my district. My district. And my, so, my friend's district. Of my friends that are watching this out there, listen to what he is saying. So what's next? Cedar Park, Leander, Williamson County. Um, so, I mean, what's next with, with, with the, the police going away? And, you know, we do share a border in Cedar Park. And like I said, I was on the city council. We actually just increased our police department budget in our last budget by about half a million dollars. And that's personnel. I mean, that's raises to keep the officers there. We did add an officer. So we added an additional $100,000 or so to uh, to add an officer because that's something that's, that's very, very important to us. From a municipal perspective, as a city attorney, as a council member, if we can't enforce our laws, then we can't do anything else. It's How absolutely do you water 
Exactly. How can we provide you water, wastewater, keep your streets good? Uh, you know, I've heard stories in, in Cedar Park, in Cedar Park where I live, where we have an excellent police department of graffiti all over, you know, signs, gates to no neighborhoods, gated communities being knocked down or broken. Mine, into. Was, mine was less than a month yeah. ago. Um, and the neighborhood in front of mine got knocked down also. Uh, I don't I, I know. I don't know the details, but um, I've lived here nine years and it's never happened before. They just they just rammed they just rammed our gates. And yeah, I mean, I'm hearing those stories. I mean, it, it's frightening to hear. You know, we are we are a nation of laws. I mean, think about it. If if we don't have laws, then we we don't have a country. First of all, because we don't have borders, we don't have anything that separates us from any other country. Our bordering countries. We don't have states. We don't have counties. We don't have cities. Uh, if we if we don't have laws to to be enfor to enforce, so or people to enforce those laws. So. I got to ask you, you know, you have a nice life. You live in Cedar Park. You've got a very successful law firm. You've got a beautiful family. Um, you're absolutely throwing your hat into what is going to be an ugly race. I don't know necessarily your race ugly. Again, I do not know your opponent. Um, but just overall, the temperature of America is so divided. Why did you do it? It's a it's a long story, but let, I'll, I'll, let me look at I'll like to look at it two ways. One is that I said before I have a wife, I have an eleven year old, and I have an eight year old, and the pattern that I see this country going down in the media, and particularly if you watch through the, the Democratic uh, debates when they were deciding who was going to be the Democratic candidate for president, quite honestly, frightened me. Uh, to see where this is going. And it's only ramped up since then. I mean, they're talking about the Supreme Court. Right now, I watched a little bit this morning with Amy Barrett going forward, talk about if they can, if the Democrats can gain that, the House, the Senate, and the presidency, that they're going to add four more justices to the Supreme Court so they can con completely control everything. I mean, what that would do would basically ruin, it would do away with the separation of powers that was established uh, you know, in our constitution. So that's one of the reasons it's wanting to have a country that's there for my family. That's the biggest thing. Uh, but for personally, cause you're right, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy uh, decision to do, but I really, you know, going through and praying about it and talking to people that you know, there's two books in the Bible, they're together, Nehemiah and Esther, and just going through that. And I really believe that if God could work in those situations through one individual, and I believe that the United States, unfortunately, is a post-Christian country, but has really, really strong influence here. That if God can do that through uh, countries that didn't acknowledge his existence and his power, that he can do so much here in the United States if people will step up. And, you know, I didn't want to be somebody who didn't answer the call. And when it was my time, uh, such a time as this, that I didn't do it. So uh, those are the two reasons. One, it was personal with my relationship with Christ. And the other one is because I want to I want to see this country continue to be a great place uh, for my family to live. And I, and I really believe that if the if the wrong people get in control, that they will change the entire makeup of this country. One, one of the things that's been really interesting to me as we watch this and is that it's almost like if you're patriotic, if you're a fan of the United States, then you're you're automatically a Trump supporter. You're a Republican. My one of my neighbor's daughter who's in high school, uh, they had red, white and blue uh, light so they put on their house during the COVID thing when everybody said you know Derek could decorate your house and everything and his daughter came home a high school student and said I want you to take those down because people might see those and think that we're Trumpies and so and then a friend and, and I have a niece who lives in an apartment complex and they have they sent out a flyer to everybody and they forbid them to fly the American flag at their apartment complex in Austin and I'm just like when, when did being a patriot and loving the red white and blue when did that become partisan I, I don't understand where that's coming from. And, and like I said, every little thing that we see just makes it a little more and more scary. But it's almost like you've got a party out there who hates what the United States is right now and feels like that it's got to be changed. And, and with everything that we've talked about, about the social injustice, anything, what change has all the rioting and the protesting brought on? Uh, you know, I don't want to get into to the federal stuff because I'm running for state, but Tim Scott, who's a senator, tried to bring across a bill to do law enforcement reform and the Democrats voted it down. So, I mean, you know, what, I'm not sure what they're actually asking for other than to change this great country that I live. So, you know, you mentioned earlier and you brought this up, you said, you know, you're Hispanic and, you know, and that, you know, and that you're proud. And so did you, have you ever felt, I mean, do you feel like 
that you yeah. represent, you know, all people, whether they're Hispanic or that, you know, like in our community, like, like, like and, and, and I, I'm trying to say, so, you know, I mean, our community is made up of a lot of different people, a lot of nationalities, a lot of ethnicities, religions. Tell us how you're going to represent everybody, how, how, you know, it won't just be based on Christianity or it won't just be based on, you know, being a Republican. What is your, what is your view on representing people out there who, who, who don't look like us, who don't believe what we believe. I think that's an important question. Because I don't know that anybody's really addressing it in any of the elections on either side. Yeah, so let, let me start that question because that, that is fantastic. Is one of, the, one of the things that's been the greatest joy is being running for this office, and then I don't know why it didn't become such a big deal with Cedar Park, is I've had the opportunity to speak to, there are a ton of Hispanics that are, are voting for Trump. I mean, they're huge supporters of Trump. Oh, my, my, my best friends, I went and picked up a Latino for Trump sign yeah. and they got it in their front yard. You know, the Contreras's, I mean, oh yeah. yeah. I have a Latinos for Trump in my front yard and I had somebody, I, I, I was like about ready to defend myself. This truck comes barreling into my driveway and when my neighbors hops out, he goes, where did you get that? And how do I get one? I mean, it's been a big deal, but you know, we had a Trump parade that we, we did on Saturday. And I was amazed by how many Hispanic families are are supporting Trump. And you know, being Hispanic. Are you a first generation college graduate, or did, did your father graduate before he served us? And like a little bit about your family and, and sure. it, so my 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 grandparents. My grandma was from Mexico. Uh, my grandfather was born here, uh, but her only language—I shouldn't say her first language—her only language was Spanish. She died. Uh, not knowing how to, to speak English. She had the equivalent of about a second or third grade education coming from, from Mexico. Um, my father uh, was actually one of eight, but he was actually the only one who, he was actually eight, and he was the only one who lived uh, past the age of two. So, um, and his dad died of a heart attack when he was three. So he was raised by a single mom uh, who didn't speak English. They were from San Antonio. His first language was English, uh, was Spanish. In fact, he learned English is when he went to start going to school in San Antonio, they actually hit them with rulers every time they use Spanish. So that's that's how he learned English. But uh, no, he he actually was in the Air Force uh, during the Vietnam era, and after that, uh, used the GI Bill to to get an education at, at then Southwest Texas State University before coming a, a police officer. So you know, you know, you looked at the American dream. Our family is the American dream. I mean, my my dad grew up where one pair of jeans a year is that that's what he got. And uh, they were extremely poor, and he worked really, really hard uh, to make a life for my family better. And now I'm trying to even, even better, you know, take it even further than, than what he did. And my mom, uh, she's an Italian actually, and her dad was uh, from Italy. Came over right after World War One and started working at Lockheed uh, down in California, and worked there for I think about 40 years before retiring from there. So I'm, I'm actually from a family of, of immigrants. I was about to say, you're from a family of immigrants. So, yeah. and so I just find it interesting because so many people want to put people in buckets. Well, if you're Hispanic or African-American, if you're Muslim or you're this or that, you must be a Democrat. And like that could be the farthest thing from the truth because I've got so many Republican friends that are from, from everywhere, right? And so that's why I wanted you to tell everybody your story that you are from a family of immigrants and that you're very proud to, to your country. What uh, is we, before we jump on to the next thing, and one thing I wanted to say, one of the things that's been the greatest joy for me in learning this is being able to talk to different individuals. And, you know, as, as I've been going around, I've gotten to talk to a, a lot of um, black people who live here in Cedar Park and in Leander. And with every single one, every single one I've spoke to feel, does not feel like race is an issue here. They feel like they're part of a community. Every single one has told me that. And so that was really, really good to hear. But the joy part has been is I've really gotten to dive into and be really accepted by uh, the, the Hindu community. And one of the things I think is interesting with them, they're very clear to tell you that they are American Hindu, not Hindu Americans. They're American Hindu. They have such a pride of being part of this community and being part of the United States of America and working with them has been amazing. I actually have five or six of them who, after meeting to them and doing a, a forum with them, with their community, they actually started block walking for me. So yeah. um, it's just fantastic to see that. And so you talked about representation. Uh, you know, I believe that America is the best place in the world to live. Is it perfect? No, but it's run by people. So it's never going to be perfect. But it is by far, I can't think of any place that even comes close to the United States of America. And the, what makes it great is because it gives you the opportunity 
to succeed no matter what your color is. I do not believe that we have systemic racism uh, in the United States right now. Uh, I have helped write um, police policies for departments all over the state, including use of force policies. There's nothing in there that is biased to race, religion, ethnicity, gender, uh, sexual preference. Nothing in there is biased is towards that. So I don't believe that our foundation here is, is systemically racist. And so this is the greatest place to live. So furthering what our founding fathers have built upon and furthering this country and allowing the freedom. I think that's the best way to represent people of any color, ethnicity, race, and gender. What will you stand for? And I'll put it out into the positive universe when you are elected um, as our house district representative, what will you stand for? What will, what will your first hundred days look like? What are you going to go after? So whew, first hundred days. That's interesting though. Well, you know, the things that, that I want to see our, our state stay strong with is we have a strong sense of individual property rights. I think that's very, very important. Uh, part of that goes into kind of an unpopular, well, I guess it's popular in Texas, but the second amendment and having the right uh, to have firearms, to protect your your property, to protect your family. I mean, that's one of the things that was kind of dumbfounding to me as I was looking through Representative Busey's voting history is he voted basically against every second amendment bill. And some of those were only, I mean, they would be like 110 to 20 or something. So it was really only the furthest left that were voting against them. And, and a majority, a vast majority of the Democrats in the House were voting in favor of these bills and he was voting against them. Now, the other thing I think is extremely important is we have, people call it the Texas miracle, the Texas economy. It's the 10th largest economy in the world, the state of Texas is. Uh, the oil and gas industry is huge. And I think we've made great strides with regard to pollution and making things clean. But if you follow, you know, some of the rhetoric regarding uh, the environment, you know, you shut down the oil and gas in Texas, you're going to shut down our economy. Uh, one of my, not Representative Busey, but there's a, a late libertarian that jumped in the campaign is you know, he wants to bring in uh, gambling and he wants to bring in, uh, you oh, know, what? For, to, uh, to, to boost the Texas economy, oh. bring in gambling and bring in free sale, you know, the free growth and sale of marijuana and unregulated. Let's just, bring, the let's, just, let's just bring the crime, please, in the syndicate. Right. Well, but, but my thing is we don't need that boost in our economy. Our economy is so strong. It's so diverse. And so we need to keep that. And how do we keep that? Is we keep the government out of business. Well, I have an idea. Why, why don't we, we bring all them in and then we can defund the police? <laughs> <laughs> and then where are we all going to move is what I need to know, Mike. Where are right. we going to go? And then we'll take away the Second Amendment at the same time. Exactly. So you, we'll just go ahead and yeah. take away the Second Amendment. Yeah. Right. Great, greatest place in the world was to live prior yes, exactly. to November. Right. Oh, so those things are important to me. You know, I, I believe in the sanctity of life. I believe that, uh, you know, my my wife and I we we have two children, but we had one um, who who passed away. My wife had to give give birth to her, but she it was a stillbirth, and uh, she was eleven weeks old. And her name is Grace. And uh, the I got to I got to hold her hand. I got to look into her face and, and see her. That that was a baby. Grace Grace was my child. Um, like I said, she had fingers, she had toes, she had eyes, she had a mouth. At eleven weeks old, and um, she wasn't a baby just because my wife and I wanted her. She was a baby because she was a baby. She was a, a gift of God. So that's something that's very dear uh, to my heart is the sanctity of life. Um, that when there's a heartbeat, there's a, there's a baby. There's that's important. There's a lot of other things working municipalities that I think that we we need to secure. Um, I have pretty broad range of, of knowledge and law, but like water law is a big deal in this state in municipalities, and I see how that's affected, particularly in areas of groundwater. I want to look at that. I want to rewrite some of the the penal code issues where when you talk about communication and working together between counties and cities uh, to make that that smoother. So there's actually a lot of things that I would like to, to jump into uh, on that. Also, I'd like to look at the, the CPS system, you know, and how that works and, and facilitating getting uh, children out of those systems and, and into homes. Uh, I think that that's, that's really important as well. And I'd like to look at that. So there's a lot a lot of issues that I would certainly want to do. You're also an adoption attorney at the Read Your Bio. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. I, I, I've been blessed to help hundreds of families uh, adopt. I'm actually the, the founder and the coordinator of, of Williamson County Adoption Day, which is November 6th this year. We're going to do it, and we're going to do it. Thanks to Judge Brandy Halford, we're going to do it uh, partially live. We're the only ones who are going to do part of it live. 
I don't know if it's going to be outside in a parking garage, but we're going to do it. So yeah, that's a blessing to be able to be part of that. It's something I get to do that event do every year. So yes, I get to do that. It's awesome. You know, one of my former employees um, started Central Texas Table of Grace, which is a transition um, home for children. And what a blessing that has been. I was so proud of her. I, I fired her so she could go change the world. And, um, you know, so there's such a need when it comes to the kids and protection. And, you know, it's got to feel like it's such a big elephant for you. So what is the first bite you're going to take? going into it, right? It's the big elephant in the room. What is that first bite once you're elected? What are you going to do? What do you What do you see the most pressing issue in your district right now would be? The most pressing district uh, issue in our district, I believe right now, is the security and safety. Uh, like I said, we've had, in my district, we have a city that has uh, slashed their police budget. Uh, they're down, they cut their, you know, you, my son and I were having lunch at our dinner at Mighty Fine in, here in Cedar Park on Friday night. Mm -hmm. And he was facing the TV and my back was to it. And so he was every time a headline would come on, he would read it to me. And so he reads to me a headline that says uh, crime spike, not increase spike. I mean, that's a pretty now I think that well, if I was a criminal, I'd do it. I'd be like, well, hey, I can, you know, I can, go it, down or I can go rob it. It's all cool. Yeah. It said crime spike near the University of Texas being a long oh, I saw that. Texas. I actually saw that headline. OK. And so my son, who's eight years old, asked me about that. And I turned around and looked at it and. And my response is, well, what do you expect when you cut the police? I mean, that's that's what you're going to get. And that's that's in part of my district. Uh, Austin is the University of Texas is not. But part of Austin is in my district. And so that's that orange diploma be, behind you. You got that little weird thing about UT, right? Yes, I do. You got it all on, on my chair, too. Also, I get a lot. Of <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So uh, I think that's going to be one of the biggest issues. Um, also, one of the you know, obviously we're going into redistricting this session. So that's this session. We're going to be writing not only our state house districts, not only our state senate districts, but also our congressional districts. And Texas is probably going to grant, gain two more house states. So redistricting is, that's the redistricting and budget are the two most important things that uh, we're going to be doing this next legislative session. And so if you're the average person and you're watching this and you know, you're not as, as tied to some of the political stuff that you and I are, but especially you, how does that affect me? I'm sitting home in my house in Cedar Park, Texas. You know, I'm a teacher. My husband, you know, works hard. We've got, you know, 2.3 kids. How does, how does, how does this affect them? How does it affect their paycheck, their taxes, their safety? I mean, give, give me that perspective for the person who's going to watch this that goes, okay, that's all great, but I don't have guns in my house and I don't do that. I mean, you know, how does it affect the average citizen? And Whether so, you're elected or Mr. Boosie's elected. So the, the biggest thing is the continuation of our Texas economy. When, and I, I've heard the arguments from people, you know, stop talking about economy. It's not about money. It's about people. But how it's going to affect our economy, that, that influences everything. If you look at areas that have strong economies versus areas that have, have weaker economies and how that, that influences everything. And it, so it filters down everything. It filters down from the government all the way down into your own, into your own pocketbook. So what your neighborhoods look like. Uh, the roads that you drive on, the schools that your kids go to, uh, your law enforcement, your if you have a fire and the fire department's going to come from, that's all going to get the local job market. market. Let's be real. If you know, if if taxes are raised, like what they're telling us is going to happen, small businesses are going to have to close. They're not going to be. I mean, they're already trying to survive COVID, right? right? They're already trying to make the big comeback from COVID, and now all of a sudden, you know, the Democrats are talking about raising business taxes. I, it's like, how will these businesses survive? Yeah. So, you know, there's two aspects to, to talk about that. And I was actually just about to, to get through one of the things that uh, Representative Busey has said on the forums is, is cutting these corporate loopholes. But he never says what the corporate loopholes do. And he, now, and he never says how the corporate loopholes affect Texas. Now, you know, you've heard Biden now, talk now about- Now, he works for charter schools, doesn't he? Does he have a business that, that sustains charter schools? Well, hey, works with sports. Sells to charter schools? Yeah, works with sports with charter schools. That's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. I was just so, wondering. um but so the, you got the two aspects. You got the the big corporations that they they provide so many jobs, and not just jobs to their companies, but because of the the trickle down. I mean, one of the cities I represent had a big uh, Halliburton facility, and I say had because it closed recently. And wow, the trickle down effect has been everything. Restaurants close are closing. Uh, you know, hotels can't stay open. Uh, the the now the government the small government's got to figure out what they're going to do with that loss of that sales tax that was coming through there 
So the big corporations are so important uh, to the areas because they help fund and keep the smaller businesses open. So you've got that big aspect. So we need to keep that going in Texas and economic development, bring, uh, bringing corporations in. I work in Cedar Park. We've done quite a bit of that. The other aspect, as you said, was the small businesses. And if you look at some of the, the, some of the things that other cities have done throughout the United States and even Austin, you don't have to go very far with, you know, mandating different types of leave for employees, no matter if they're part time. Uh, you know, those are the types of restrictions you put on small business that are going to choke small business to death. And, you know, we don't have a lot of time, you know, but you know, one of the things we're talking about is raising the minimum wage to a level. I mean, I believe that the free market should should dictate that if you raise the minimum wage for jobs that that the companies can't actually you know, make that money off that individual, what you're going to be doing is actually going to be losing jobs is, is what you're going to be doing. So we need to let the market control that. And that's going to filter down. That's going to keep our economy solid. The more we mess with it as governments, the worse it is. I believe that if we let Texans handle our recovery, the, the, our, our recovery will be solid. Yeah, I have to tell you, as a, as a business owner, you know, the last thing I want to do is tango with the government. I'm like, you know, I've, I've done this for 25 years. I've been very successful. Do not get into my cookies, into my post toast. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't need the government to tell me what to do and how to do it, because to your point, you let the free market decide, right. you know, if somebody wants to work for us and we pay a great wage, then they'll be there and we can pay a great wage. If our company is successful, mm -hmm. our company can be successful if we're not bogged down in red tape taxes and bureaucracy. Right. It's just this domino, domino, domino thing. All right. So final question. Do you think you're going to make a career out of politics or like, is this something like you're like, okay, I'm just going to keep going. I someday notice like what, like, do you, you know, I mean, I'm kind of kidding, but like, you know, do you see staying in, in Texas in your backyard? I mean, you know, what do you see for yourself? You're a young guy. Oh, wow. That's a, that's an interesting question, Lisa. So your what wife is probably doing? watching this going, tell her to stop right now. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. uh, my phone hasn't rang. So, uh, yeah, so, uh -huh. she, so that's a good thing from her. So, you know, when I was in law school, so I graduated in 99 from uh, University of Texas School of Law. There was a law firm that was in Dallas that I was actually clerking with and thought that I was going to end up going working there. Well, one of the, the named partners in that firm was named was Domingo Garcia. And he was a Democratic state representative, state representative out of Dallas. And so during that session, I got the opportunity uh, to work with him in, in his office there at the Capitol. And there, there were some aspects of that that I, that I really enjoyed, but there were some aspects of it that I, I, I didn't enjoy too much. So when I, so I, I told myself that politics was not going to be anything that I was uh, going to get into. And, you know, it wasn't until you know, I had the request back in you know, December of, of 17 to run for city council that I said, OK, I'll, I'll do city council. It's nonpartisan. Don't have to get into the politics side of it. You know, don't have to be a D or an R to run. Uh, you know, even though my background is R, I've always voted, always voted Republican. Don't have to get into that with city council. And so I did the city council thing. And I'll be honest with you, I thoroughly enjoyed being on the city council. Uh, I really felt like with my background, it gave me an opportunity to really get some things accomplished. I made some relationships with individuals that I hope are, are lifelong uh, through that process. Uh, so, you know, when I when they first asked me to run for state representative, I, I said no, just like that. Thank you, but no thank you. About two months later, they came back to me and they said, no, 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 you really need to run. And here's why it needs to be you that runs. And so I thought about it, prayed about it. Like as I was talking about it, uh, just happened to be going through. I, read, I start my day every morning by reading, through, reading the Bible. And I just happened to be reading through Esther and Nehemiah at that time. And so I decided to run for this. So right now, um, state representative is my focus. If anything happens, that's going to be between, uh, you know, it's going to be up to God to, to direct that to me. So no, I don't have any aspirations of moving beyond here. I'm just focused right now on state representative and, you know, doing everything and making my family and making God proud uh, for being in this spot right now. Well, I want to thank you very much. Number one, for agreeing to this interview. And uh, number two, you know, for putting it out there, you know, for, for, for answering the call, you know, there's many people out there, um, you know, years and years and years, like a long time ago, you know, I, they reached out to me, the Republican party, and they said, you need to run. I was like, uh, uh, no, nope. <laughs> Not doing it. And, you know, because I just, you know, I didn't feel led to do it. Number two, I just didn't want to get in the muck of all of it. Right. And so, uh, you know, I was very involved with U.S. Senator Kay Bailey Hutchison. I ran her campaign for Williamson County. Um, 
And I just saw the ugly side of politics. And so I want to commend you. I want to thank your wife and your family because boy, it's a whole lot more contentious today than it was the 20 years ago that, you know, I was working heavily with the party and, um, you know, just for, for taking a chance. And so I guess most importantly, Mike, I'd like to say that you've earned my vote. And I know my husband's watching this right now and to tell you that you've earned his vote also. So that I appreciate. And, um, you know, whatever the outcome is, I think you and I are both people of faith and we both know that, you know, we gave it all we got and, you know, you, you put everything on the field and at some point, you know, the cards were going to, we're going to fall where they fall. But right. I would just tell everybody out there who, who watches me and who follows me, you know, vote, 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 you know, because it's, you know, you don't have a right to criticize our great country and the democracy of our country if, if you sat on the sidelines you know, and didn't vote or didn't do things like this, because I'm sure I'm going to get some blowback for doing this. And, you know, and I, I somebody said that to me today and I said, I, I have to, I have to find out from him live and I'm not going to tell him what I'm going to say, but I want to know, because to me, this is probably one of the most important votes that I'll make living in Cedar Park and my friends who live there in Leander and in Northwest Austin because this is going to affect us directly. This is going to affect our backyard. You know, again, we have we all have one vote, but nationally it's a little harder to um, to get involved and to make a difference as it is in our own backyard. So, Mike, I wish you luck. I wish you success. You've earned our vote. You've earned my vote. My family's support, and um, I'm anxious to I'm anxious to attend um, the victory party. <laughs> Hopefully we will have a, an election that we can call on uh, November. Is it second or third? Third. <laughs> third. Okay. Yeah. That's what I thought. Uh, but early voting starts tomorrow. So I'm just going to go get it knocked out. I'm going to go care. just get it knocked out. So, sir, thank you very much. And again, thank you to your family. Thank you for your service to our community and ultimately our state and our country. So very nice to get to meet you. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking your time and using this forum. Like you said, you're probably going to get some blowback and I'm hearing that from a lot of people, but thank yeah. you. But you know what? If you if you if you don't stand for something, you fall for anything. That's right. All right, Mike, thank you. Take care and good luck. Thank you.